Awesome. Thank you for thank you for the handoff. Um, I actually normally come out of Dallas, Texas. Um, so this is definitely a bit of a shift. Um, but I'm super excited to be here and be able to share this conversation with you. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you guys. And we are going to spend a little bit of time talking about what the business model canvas can do for your business, no, to, no matter where you're at in that journey. All right. So let's talk about canvassing for ideas because the business model canvas is a fantastic way to vet an idea that you're working on. And that doesn't matter whether you have an established company and you're looking to explore different streams of revenue or whether you are very, very early stage and you're wondering, is this idea for a product something that I can actually turn into a business? Because that's where a lot of, especially first time startup founders fall short in their first attempt is they don't always know how to connect those dots and make sure that all the pieces fit together to make an, an idea into a full blown business. So it's a single page document. Um, it has 11 boxes and you can do it in any possible mixture of things that you want to be able to create your idea for your business. All right, so a little bit about me. My name is Holly. I am the founder of Equal Business Solutions. And my, my quick and fast version is we support startups in the spaces that serve them. I build programs for accelerators and incubator spaces for startups, as well as providing advisory services on the back end of such spaces and providing one-on-one -on -one advisory to clients. So my mission is to change the founder experience through connection and access to resources. And that largely comes out of me being a more traditional type of founder. I come out of the food service space originally. I've owned restaurants and bakeries and all sorts of food trucks and things. And that process for me was incredibly, incredibly painful. Um, <laughs> some might even say awful. I didn't know anybody that had ever started a business. I didn't really know what I was doing. I was a trained pastry chef, so I knew how to create fantastic products that people loved and my customers loved coming into my spaces. But what I didn't understand was how to put all the pieces together and turn it into a profit building business. Um, it took me about five years to fully grasp how to do that and how to build that. And during that five year journey, I reached out to every possible resource that I could figure out how to. And the, the core problem was that there wasn't really anybody to help me at that stage. Everybody kept saying, come back later, come back later. Well, I may have never gotten to later had I actually followed that advice. So through a lot of just diligence and you know, perseverance, I figured out how to turn my business into something that was profitable, but it wasn't unpainful. Um, so my goal is to help change that circumstance for everybody that my company serves. So the business model canvas is a 10,000 foot view. And what that allows you to do as a founder is to look at all the different segments of what makes up a profitable growing business and filter parts of your idea into that to make sure that you're touching on all the core aspects of what that means. And I have I'm going to be sharing with you guys at the end of today's conversation, and I think it's linked somewhere else as well, access to be able to use these canvases, which I borrowed from co-starters, um, which is a really fantastic, fillable, really easy to use. Because um, when the first person shared with me the, the business model canvas, it was a printed out PDF that was like grainy and terrible. And I looked at it and I thought, what on earth am I supposed to do with that? I promptly did absolutely nothing with it. Um, so I don't want you to have that experience. So I've tried to curate a list of things that are going to be able to help you go through this process if you've never gone through it before and help you understand how to put the pieces together to create this 10,000 foot view of this theoretical business or even revenue model that you might want to be adding to what you're building. So we're going to look at all the things that build up to that. Okay, so we need as business owners answers to all the different categories to actually start thinking about how that's going to be impacting growth. 
Um, so we want to understand who your customer is, why that's your customer, and that might even shift if you're adding a new line of revenue or a new product feature. Um, so you want to understand exactly who this particular piece that you're building is going to be serving and why it matters to them. What's the acute problem that you're solving for them? Uh, because it's really important to understand those pains that you're solving for with your business, because that can, if you don't understand that, it can create a misalignment between your customer and your product. Therefore, they will never see the true value in the solution that you're building for them. Um, so then circling that over to the solution, understanding how the solution that you're providing them is a better solution for their needs. And it may simply be that you're delivering it in a way that they enjoy more or you're making it more accessible to them. But you've really got to have a true, simple understanding of what the problem is and how the solution that you're creating is solving that problem for your specific customer. We're going to look at what are the alternatives to the solution that you're offering, because if you don't understand that landscape, you will fall into all of the potholes along the way, trying to understand how to how to win, how to get your product all the way to market and make it successful. What are the benefits that you're going to be providing to your customers are going to be how you separate yourself from those alternatives that they understand and see and know around them. Because a lot of times the alternatives that you're fighting against are going to be the things that are already very well established. So you want to understand how you can fit in between those gaps and the benefits that you're creating with that solution are going to really, really solve those problems. So understanding what that messaging is and how to communicate that to your particular customer is going to be really key. And we need to have a deep understanding of how to share what that product is and how it solves a problem in the language that your customers understand, which is where a lot of people struggle, especially as first time founders, is how to merge those things and merging what you know as the founder, as the solution creator with the messaging that your customer needs to hear to understand how to fit your product or service into their lives. Um, one of the things that really doesn't always come up right away, uh, but it's important to start thinking about in the very beginning of any concept is going to be that distribution. So understanding how does your product or service get to your customer, because that might actually shape how you're creating that messaging, how how you're serving your unique customers. So that distribution channel can also be something that makes a difference to how you're communicating what your product is. Um, and then the big thing that we always forget is to look at the revenue from the very, very beginning. Um, we, you don't want to build a product that can't ever cash flow. You don't want to build a service that nobody wants to pay for. Um, I work with tons and tons of startup founders across the world. And one of the most common problems is they get really fixated on a solution and they don't take the moment to go and research and understand what the revenue flows might look like for that in the very beginning. They get months, sometimes years into production of what they're trying to create. And then they look at the revenue and they realize no one's willing to actually pay for the product or service I'm trying to sell. Um, I have a, a client that I worked with out of Austin, Texas, that um, they had a real problem. They spent two years creating a solution. And when they finally took it to market, they discovered that clients were only willing to pay less than $1 to utilize the product that they had built. And there was absolutely no way they would ever be able to pull in enough revenue to be cash flow positive, not even cash flow neutral. So it's important to understand what that revenue flow looks like, even as you're in early stages planning for it. And then what are all those startup needs that are going to be unique costs and bumps in the road for that first year to two years of business? Um, just recently, I heard someone say that that the the the, the make or break timeline for a business is going to be 18 months, and I had never heard that before. But in retrospect, when I look back at all of the different things that I have helped start up or started up myself, 18 months is somehow a magical turning point of people start to remember that you exist. 
you start to become the go-to in their brain for whatever service or product you're offering. So those unique startup needs basically need to carry you through that 18 month period. And you need to understand what that's going to cost so that you have enough runway built in to create the success that you're trying to build. All right, so the best way that I know of to learn is to learn by applying something really simple and really logical to something that might seem complicated. So as I have gone on this journey of helping people understand how to start businesses, one of the main problems is that we give out this business model canvas and people look at it and they're overwhelmed because it's all these boxes with teeny tiny spaces and it requires so much information, so much knowledge that you actually might really not have when you're still in ideation. So I'm going to walk you through a really high level way to apply the business model canvas to something really simple. So we're going to start with an idea. We're going to call it the red pencil company. So something super simple, straightforward, uncomplicated. So the first thing we're going to look at is what is the solution that we're creating? So what is that solution? We're going to sell red painted number two pencils. Straightforward. Don't overcomplicate it. Don't don't detail what kind of wood, what kind of eraser, where they're coming from. What is the solution you're offering? As clear and as simple as you can distill it down. So if, if like if we're talking about something like if you were thinking of Zoom, let's the, take something big. Like that would be a video solution that's easily accessible. Like something, take something big and make it as simple as possible in this scenario because you want to look at all the pieces and how they interact. You don't want to get lost in the details of what the product is that you're trying to build. So the, I mentioned earlier that the understanding who your customer is is going to be really, really crucial to understanding how to get your product to market and to make it cash flow positive. So what we want to understand is who is buying your product? Who are you serving? And there are complicated scenarios where your customer is not necessarily your user. But this format, this business model canvas format is not necessarily the place to start exploring that. That's going to be something that you really want to dive into as you move beyond this and start either adding a new product feature to your business plan or start building your business plan from scratch. So I want to like caution, don't get don't get too distracted by that because sometimes your your buyer is not your user and this is not the place to start understanding that. This is the place where we're going to understand who is going to be buying the product, period. Um, so in this scenario for the red pencil company, the customers are going to be things like school districts because they serve students and teachers and then testing facilitation facilities. I went for the alliteration there. Um, so the next piece of that is going to be looking at the problem. So what is the problem that your customer has that you are solving for? So this is where the big scary words of uh, market research come in um, and keeping in mind that market research can be as simple and as straightforward as sending out surveys to your target audience and understanding what they want. So that is what I used as an example here. We sent out surveys and with those surveys, it was discovered that students are more excited about non-yellow pencils, that of color choices given to them, red was the preferred color choice, and teachers enjoyed having an alternative to the standard yellow so that they could mix it up within their classroom. So the problem that we are solving with the Red Pencil Company is they wanted more options for testing scenarios to create joy within that moment. So then we look at the alternatives. We want to understand what is the current solution. Uh, the current solution in this scenario is only yellow number two pencils are available in bulk. And I want to draw attention to the fact that I specified in bulk. Because as you work through this piece of the business model canvas, it's important to understand exactly the problem you're solving. So in this scenario, we are not talking about selling pencils on a shelf in a store to be purchased one by one. We're talking about selling large bulk orders of singular colored pencils. So I think that that's something, the reason I want to draw attention to that is it's really easy to get distracted by all of the different options 
for how your product could be sold or could be utilized. But using the business model canvas, you want to focus on one. You can create more than one business model canvas at any given time. So let's say you explore, and this one, we're exploring this bulk option. You could create a second one that explores selling the colored pencils in say retail spaces like grocery stores or Target or even online locations. But we wanna make sure that you're identifying one problem and solution per business model canvas. Um, so and that's something that I wish someone had said when I first was handed that really terrible gummy piece of paper that it looked awful and I didn't understand what to do with is because I thought I was running at the time a cafe. I had, I don't even know, a hundred different flows of revenue that were happening at that moment. I did catering, I did all sorts of stuff. And I looked at that one singular piece of paper and I thought, no way, there is no way on earth I can put this on one piece of paper that doesn't make sense, this is crazy. And I threw it in the garbage. Had someone taken the time to slow down and tell me, okay, so let's create a business model canvas for each stream of revenue. That would have made so much more sense. So I take all of that time to share that with you, to be able to tell you, like, make sure that you understand what is the solution that you're solving for on each business model canvas. And if your product has multiple scenarios for solution, explore all of them. Because what this might net for you is that you under, start to understand that one is far more viable and easier to take to market than others. So you want to use this as like a really fast way to start to discover is this a product that's viable and can be taken all the way to market and what does that journey look like? So back on task, uh, we're looking at the alternatives for the product that we're trying to sell, which is the red pencil company. So currently only yellow number two of pencils are available in bulk. So we are creating a solution that offers a different option. Okay, so what are the benefits? What does your customer want from your product or your service and, and how are you solving that problem that they have? Um, so like I said, market research, customer research, we asked, um, we sent out surveys. We did that process of due diligence and understanding what the market we're trying to serve wants from the product types we're trying to offer. Um, so we're solving the problem by selling red number two pencils in bulk. Very straightforward. That didn't exist with our product space. Now it will exist. Um, so the other problems we're buying individually priced red pencils is cost prohibitive, which is something that within that survey, teachers indicated they had been doing because it allowed them to give some sort of joy or excitement to create happy feelings around giving standardized tests, which everyone knows that's not really fun. So teachers really reach and try to figure out ways to do that, but they end up spending too much money when they're creating a, a custom solution like buying bunches of singular pencils. So we're solving that really unique, really specific pain point that, that, that the customers that we're trying to reach feel acutely. So while the students and teachers desire the red product, there is no alternative to buy bulk. So that's the thing that you need to understand when you're looking at who your competition is going to be and what are the unique benefits that you offer is are you creating either a process or a meeting place or a service package or something of that nature that is going to be unique enough that it's something your customers have identified they really, really are hungry for. They have an acute pain that you're trying to solve for. And the hard reality is that if you're not actually solving for an acute pain, they may not actually be interested in spending the money consistently. You don't necessarily want customers that only come once to buy your product. You want customers that either are return or consistent customers or are making lots of referrals. If it's a larger product, you wouldn't buy repeatedly. So understanding what that landscape looks like is really, really important. So. Taking the time and looking at what are the advantages that your company offers? Um, what gives you an edge over the alternatives? Uh, so what makes you the one? So when I'm helping coach people on giving their 60 second or elevator pitches, one of the things that I drill home again and again is why you? Why you and why now? And that's this little piece of this business model canvas is for that. It's to identify why is your solution the right solution right now? So in this scenario, um, the red pencil company is built by Georgie and Gina. 
Georgie is a logistic expert that knows how to get the pencils into distribution. And Gina is a board member of the National Testing Group and has been witnessing all of this feedback and demand for the product. So she can raise the profile of the red pencil by making it available to her audience. So this is this the moment where you get to really, really identify why your team or your product is, is the right one at the right time. What gives you that edge? And in this scenario, the fact that it's someone who can get the product into distribution and into the hands of the users is huge because I don't know how many people with us today are retail based, but that's a big piece of it that often doesn't get considered until you're in action. And then you have to create that solution of how are you getting your product into the hands of your users? Um, and sometimes that really hurts. Uh, there's a, a client that I was working with and they did something called diamond painting, which I had never heard of. If you've never heard of it, it's really interesting. Um, and they had a very successful product and they had been going to trade shows and selling this product in real life. So their distribution channel was their bodies going into, into spaces and selling this product. And when the pandemic hit and shipping prices changed, that was also aligned with the time that they launched their e-commerce. And what happened, which I don't know if any of you have had this, this horrible experience yet, but the shipping prices went sky high. And so they took, they went from having a product that was extremely highly profitable and in huge demand, who knew, um, and being able to, to get it into the hands of their customers on a regular basis to, they almost lost their company fully. They went half a million dollars into debt being able to get their product into the hands of their users simply because they had not thought through what that distribution channel looked like and they were individually shipping things and shipping costs were too high. So in this scenario, understanding that the edge that, that this company has is that they have someone that understands those distribution channels that's in-house, understands it, is building it into the plan is going to be a true advantage of why they, they are competitive, why they're the ones to take the product to market. And then with the other person that's, that's part of this team, Gina, she is a member of the, the, the National Testing Group, which means that she has the access to understand that this is actually a product that people would pay for. She understands where the cash flows come from to be able to pay for this product that you're trying to sell because that's a huge piece of it that we don't always understand in very, very early stages, but it's crucial to understand before you go to market is where's the cash coming from that's going to be buying the product. So having someone on your startup team that has that built-in knowledge because of their professional experience, that's a huge add. So understanding what sets you apart is gonna be a big, big deal as you go about planning. Okay, so let's take a breath and we're gonna talk a little bit about messaging. Um, so what's the story and how does your customer want to hear it? So when asked about that, they the, the Red Pencil team said, we reached out to the market by sharing the data with testing companies. We let them have access to the product for marketing and branding photo shoots that we offer to pay for. Um, that makes the red pencil the new yellow pencil. So starting to create an expectation that if you work with a specific company, you get this up-level product, which is a very, a very yeah, acute, interesting way of going to market and not an unknown one. That's one that's very popular is creating a premium placement. Um, so understanding who your customer is and how they want to hear your messaging is gonna make a huge, huge impact for how your messaging is received. So in this scenario, because they're doing it through the testing companies and through the facilities, they're creating an expectation on the other side that the better facilities have the better pencils. So you're creating an expectation in your end user's mind that they want that and they may even ask for it. So then you've made it their idea to ask for the product that you provide. So as you might be able to tell from that statement, it's, it's really important to understand messaging and how your audience needs to receive the information about your product, because it's not just one way. And, and the, like some of the, the more simple, straightforward ways are gonna be just general marketing and social media presence and the things that we all know and love, 
but there are so many different channels to understanding how to get your message to your audience dependent on what your product is. So there are one of the, the more clever ways that um, I've been able to help expose some of the companies that I have worked with is because I work with accelerators and startups and all of this whole bubble of new business space is some of the companies that I support also serve that space. And so by me utilizing their product, when I'm working with them, they, it gets in their head that that's the product that they want to use. So understanding who your user is and who your buyer is and how to get that messaging to them, it may not be the obvious way. There may be very clever back end ways that you can get that information to them and make it their idea to start using your product. All right, so we're gonna circle back to that distribution question because that was a really big deal when I was talking about why this team and why this product right now. And in this scenario, this is gonna be a B2B. Um, it's really important to understand what those distribution channels look like. And if you're a B2B or a B2B2C or a B2C, um, it's important to understand how your product gets into the hands of your user and to start conceptualizing that from the very beginning. Um, I also think it's really interesting in this red pencil scenario that it is a B2B. We're not bothering in this, in, in this version of looking at this business idea, we're not bothering with any of the retail or e-commerce or other avenues that you might be able to get a retail product into the hands of a customer. We're starting with the largest bulk case use, which is going to allow the product to be purchased and created at a lower cost. Because when you're doing a B2B model, you can do it in larger pieces, therefore creating larger bulk and reducing the cost. So when you do make a decision from that point forward and you're looking, okay, other ways I can pull revenue from the same product and you start looking at B2C or retail customers, you can really start to understand what those profit margins could potentially look like if you are able to launch into retail spaces because you understand what that core price is at your wholesale level. So again, distributing directly into those testing facilities and school districts means large bulk orders, which means different shipping processes, different packaging processes that are going to be less detailed and more functional. So it's a, it's a comfortable place to start this process because it's going to be less detail oriented. You're not packaging four pencils and creating all of these tiny pieces that then have to move around and get to where they need to be. You're doing large bulk orders that are shipping all at once. So understanding what those distribution channels are and how to activate them, how to utilize them. And I'm just gonna throw one thought in there as, as you're, Thinking about what distribution looks like is as you're planning for a business, it's always good to start with the end in mind. And sometimes distribution is what gets you acquired. Um, that's one of those things that if your distribution channels are built out and understood and they are something that someone would be willing to spend money to have access to, that might be what sets your company apart if acquisition is your end goal. So understanding what all the moving pieces are of your business and starting to plan for what they will look like in the beginning is important. And it may even be that distribution when you're working on this model and you're building out this canvas, this might be a question mark. And what that would signify is that you don't know yet. You need to be able to go and research because sometimes what this business model canvas unearths is that there are things you hadn't thought about yet which there's nothing wrong with that. We all do that. We get really excited about a concept and we dive in and it's for weeks and weeks, it's very thrilling because you're exploring something new because everybody loves to get excited about a new concept, but then you really have to get, get down to the brass tacks of it and understand how is this new idea that I have that I've been working on, I'm betting it a little bit, I'm figuring it out, but how is it gonna cash flow? How am I gonna get my product to my users? all these details, and it can be extremely high level, which is what I'm trying to show you today with this red pencil concept is 
when you're going through this business model canvas, you don't have to get into the dirty details. You can be high level. You can say that you are going to utilize Amazon to ship. You can say that you are going to only deliver locally through bicycles. I mean, it doesn't matter what you're envisioning. This is a place to put it down on paper and start understanding what it would take to activate that. All right, so the thing that we all don't want to talk about until we have to, because uh, we get excited about an idea and we want to build the idea, is we have to chase the money. Um, you have to understand where, how and where are you making money from your customer base. So in the case of the red pencil company, uh, we'll make money from wholesale orders of pencils direct from the manufacturer. So cutting out any middleman. Um, there will be no placement fees for retail locations. Um, they'll be creating demand by making them exclusive to those facilities, meaning that there are no customer purchases available. So sort of upping the ante of that exclusivity that it's only for specific testing scenarios. And then um, 0.03 cents more profit per pencil as co compared to a retail placement. Um, so it's really important to understand what those differences are in pricing. So if you're going into retail placement and you know that your pencils are going to be sold individually, you actually have to understand loss margins and things like that. So if you have 100 pencils in a bin at a Target, how many of those are going to be pocketed or dropped on the floor or what does the loss look like for that? So in this scenario, there's much less of that. Um, so understanding kind of where that money will be flowing and how much revenue you can expect is really, really important. And in this scenario on the business model canvas, this is back of the napkin style numbers. This is not going to be your detailed pro forma all of your planning and metrics and data, this is going to be high level. So if I sell 100,000 pencils at X cents, this is what I'm going to make. You, you're not calculating in all of the predictive modeling that you'll have to do as you continue to build out this idea. This is a back of the napkin scenario where you start to explore, is this even worth it? How many pencils do I need to sell to make $100,000? Can I even stay in business? Um, so that's a piece that often gets forgotten because we get excited about building a product or selling a product. So starting from this junction point and starting to understand, okay, in order to reach base numbers, I need to be selling 100,000 of these a year. Well, is that feasible? Can you do that? When you look at that number, does your brain go, oh my God, there's no way that's not possible because you should trust your instincts there. And if it doesn't feel possible, maybe start exploring other ways to take your concept to market because that's what this business model canvas is for, is to start understanding which avenues are profitable and productive and which are not without you spending weeks or months working on a full-blown business plan and building out projections and doing all of those pieces. And this is for you to be able to put some ideas down fast and start to understand, do all the moving parts fit together? Does everything come together and make sense and create a model that works? Okay, I'm going to pause for a minute and talk a little bit about what startup needs are, are um, because there's a million different things that we can calculate into that process. And as I mentioned earlier, and I'm going to say it again because it, it resonated so loudly with me when someone said it, um, was the 18-month mark is where people start to remember and know that your business exists. And it's really important to have that in your head uh, because knowing that for the first full 12 months, the whole year, and I mean, once your product is launched, I don't mean while you're dreaming and building and, and thinking, I mean, post launch company open product available for purchase. It takes 12 to 18 months before customers start cycling to you. Um, so understanding what your burn rates are going to be, how much how much money you need to get through that first period of time is going to be beyond crucial because you don't want to run out just before you get to that turning point where people start to remember. Um, and that's something that I wish someone had shared with me. I think that's why the 18 month marker comment was really like it resonated so loudly 
is the first storefront business I ever opened, I closed it down at 19 months because I couldn't, I was not getting enough customer traction. And the thing was, is I had amazing reviews with my customers. I had a strong base. I had a strong social media following. I had all the things that would have eventually, now that I look in retrospect, would have eventually added up to a successful model, but I didn't have any depth of knowledge of how long it would take to actually get there. And I found it very disheartening and very frustrating to have all of these things in play and have tons of followers and have all these great reviews, but nobody's buying. And it just did not make sense to my brain. And I didn't have anybody to ask and there wasn't anybody to get help from. So I just gave up. I thought this is never going to work. I can't keep sustaining this. And I now have realized that had I just hung in there and kept plowing through for another three or four months, I hadn't reached that magic point where human brains remember that a store or a product is there. Because the reality is, is that you're fighting against things that have already been established in their day to day. So unless you're building something that is utterly unique and can quickly usurp a place that had a vacancy, you have to give your product time to saturate. You have to give people time to come and find you and then come back again. And it happens far slower than makes sense when you're in real time living it. Um, so having that level of patience and understanding what those startup needs are gonna look like. So with this red pencil company example, we're going to be looking at purchasing that initial stock that's going to be about five thousand dollars you're going to need to be able to pay for and maintain a crm system and a customer service person once you are live and running um, so that's going to be you know money that that you need to be able to spend and a good crm once you have true usability you will need to graduate out of the freemium version. Um, so understanding what that threshold is, when you'll hit it, and when you'll need to be able to pay for that is really important. Um, you'll need to build out your website, your marketing funnel. Are those things you're doing? Are you paying someone else? What does it cost? Um, so it doesn't matter what the answer to those questions are as long as you understand what the costs are. And when I say costs, I'm going to double, double click into that and say, what does it cost you in time? If you're the one building those things, which, you know, most of us do, what is the time it's going to take you to do that? Because time is money. And if that's where you're spending your time, are you neglecting something else in order to do this? Might it actually be a better expenditure of money to pay someone else to build your funnels? It's really important to start understanding what that balance looks like. And this is a good place to start netting that out and understanding what it's going to take. So what does your marketing collateral look like? Are you going to need to pay for photo shoots? Are you going to need to pay for models to come on site for photo shoots? All of the costs that can be associated depending upon what you're doing, because we can't use stock photos forever. So we have to understand what that's going to look like and, and start to think about where those thresholds are. So sure, use stock images up until month nine, but then at month nine, maybe start booking some custom photo shoots so that you can really, really start capturing the audience that's using your, your product so that they are going out and evangelizing for you. So it's important to understand what those costs are and kind of where you want to position them. Um, so in the case of the red pencil company is what does that marketing collateral cost? Um, branded pencils and actual product in the hands of their users. So that initial stock purchase of $5,000, 50% of that may go to branded pencils that are simply given out so that you're doing that market saturation and getting your product into the user's hands so that it becomes the expectations. Why does this place not have the pencils I liked so much? Who can I ask to make sure that we get the thing that I wanted? So there's a piece of that marketing that's going to simply be product if you have a tangible product and understanding what that cost looks like. So I can definitely speak to the food service space. Like the first year that I was in business running a barbecue catering company, um, that's I, probably about 50% of the money that I spent on product creation went to me giving it away. I was sponsoring events. I was doing all kinds of things where I would I would roll up and we would serve everybody and it would cost this place that we were serving nothing. 
because I was trying to get known for the product that I was selling. So, and it, I know you have to set success markers, markers at those junctures and understand what the purpose is, but you still have to understand what that cost is going to be. So each one of those events would cost me something like $500 to come in with just raw food costs. And then I had human costs on top of that and all the other stuff that goes with it of bringing up a food truck onto a site. Um, but understanding what that costs so that you can start to plan for it. Because if you don't know what it's gonna take to get your product all the way into market, that's a really dangerous scenario. So understanding what those startup needs are and how to plan for them is gonna be really crucial. So all of the things that you need to grow, what does that look like? Once you get through that startup period and you start to actively start moving, what's it going to take to do it? How many people do you need to have on board? And this is a dream scenario because you haven't built this yet. So it's, it's not what is happening. It's what you want to happen. It's how you are building the vision of what you're trying to create. So in the scenario of the red pencil company, what does that cash flow look like? Um, we need to start figuring it out. Uh, how much would it cost to have two customer service people on board so that we can start dealing with getting our product into the hands of users? We probably need to hire an operations manager because the two founders, uh, they have day jobs. So they're not going to be running this on a day-to-day -day basis until there's enough revenue flowing to be able to support that. So they may need to bring on an operations manager. And then what's that next step in getting their product to market? Do they have online ordering functionality? Or is this a scenario where you are old schooling it and you are salespeopling to the places that are used the product? You have to understand what that's going to look like as you continue to grow because your first five sales are going to look very, very different from your next 500. But you have to start wanting to understand what that looks like and how to grow it. All right, so we're gonna look back at this big picture scenario again, so you can put all the pieces together. And now that we've gone through this whole verbal process of looking at each one of these unique squares, I'm hoping that you have a better concept of how they all interplay together and how you would use this to, to vet out an idea that you're having or you're considering building out. And I wanna make sure I say again, this isn't just for startup space. This is for growing businesses as well. This is a fantastic tool to be able to use if you are having an idea about a feature you can add to your product or an additional service you can add to your space. You know, these are all things that you are going to want to go through this journey with, because if you're adding something to an established business, it's the same scenario. You you have to, again, figure out, does this product, service, whatever I'm adding work for the current customer or is this a way to bring in new customers? You know, what are the benefits? What's the solution I'm, I'm creating? So it's this isn't just something to be done the first stage of ideation and creating a business like this is a, a very impactful tool to have in your back pocket as you continue to grow as a company, because this is the first step to starting to add additional things to a larger business plan, because you can get them down on paper, you can look at how they all interconnect and you can say, well, that sounded really good when we were having dinner last night and talking about it. But now that I've got it down on paper the dots don't connect. Uh, it doesn't make sense. And if that's the scenario that you've created by just taking 30 minutes, 40 minutes and going through this one pager, think of all of the effort you're saving on the other side by taking the time to sit down and do it. Because you may actually realize rather quickly, in fact, that a business idea can't cash flow. It was a great idea, but we can't make it work. And you, the other, the reverse of that may be that you have an idea that you think, well, I don't know if that'll work at all. And you start getting it down on paper and you realize that it actually solves huge gaps that your company has been having. And you're very excited by the end of this journey. You're like, this works. This actually solves tons of problems that we've been trying to solve for years. So it's a really impactful tool that's really simple to use once you understand it. All right. So we're going to 
wrap up here momentarily and take some time for Q&A for anybody that might actually have some questions about everything I've been carrying on about. So I would love to give you the opportunity to scan the QR code or go to the website at the bottom. I'm also going to throw that into the chat for you guys because I wanna make sure that you have access to the business model canvas and to all the tools that I have worked to curate for you there. There's a couple of additional videos there on my site as well to help you work through this process because as I said, this is a very, very confusing tool if you've never used it. <laughs> Um, so I want to make sure that you have all of the ability to get the help you need as you're working through this. All right. Does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask? I'm going to click over into the Q&A section. What is better to use for product market fit and scaling up? A business model canvas or customer journey? Um, actually, I would say it's not an or, it's an and. Um, I love to use business model canvas as a fast way to work through, do all the dots connect on this? Uh, because that's a piece that that sometimes we don't really get to till we're further in um, to planning and, and vetting out an idea. This is a really good way to do that at a very surface level at the very early stages and start to understand does everything work together. Um, customer journeys or building a customer a new customer persona that this product would fit with. Those are actual great additions after you've gone through that model business model canvas and said, yeah, this works. This looks like it might make sense for my business. Let's keep digging uh, because those are going to be better for actually figuring out how this new product or service offering that you're creating fits into your spectrum. So once you've decided, yes, this this will make enough revenue to make it worth doing, then you kind of dive into that second layer. Okay, next question is, I have been told before that it's best to start with the problem and then think about customer and solution and the rest. Um, do I have a point of view on that approach? I do agree that um, I, when I work with clients on the business model canvas, I want them to start with the problem. <laughs> because if they can't identify the problem that their product or service is solving for, that's a core problem. Um, oftentimes, it's not even that the, the, the builder doesn't have a problem they're solving for, it's that they're not looking at it from that perspective and they need to step back because they're all excited about some idea they had and they're, they're excited about building something. So it's really important to start phrasing it in that way because that perspective does actually change how you're thinking about your usability for your clients and your customers. So I agree with whoever told you that before, starting with the problem. Um, I, I think that that's the best place to start on this journey. Um, does the edge have to relate specifically about the people or can the why us question be related to the company? Yes, the why us question can absolutely be related to the company. The edge piece is really just about identifying what that is. So like I'll use my own company, which is often what I do when I'm working with clients is I'll use my own company as as explaining that. Like so my edge for what I've built is that I have stood on the other side of this process. What I teach and what I work on is not theoretical for me. I've lived it. I've breathed it. It's hard. And so that's the edge that I bring to the table when I'm building programs or when I'm working with clients one-on-one -on -one is it's, it's a unique experience that I filter into that process. So yes, that edge can simply be related to the company and how the product gets delivered. Um, doesn't have to be about the people. Um, can't, so when I'm building those programs, that's a piece of it that's in there is I'm really acutely looking at how do how do startup people function? What's the timelines they need things delivered on? When are they working on things? What's the amount of time they have to allocate? So that my edge in where my products are concerned is that they are built on a depth of understanding for the user. 
And so that is the edge. That is what sets me apart. So when I'm out pitching, building a new program for someone, that's what I'm pitching is that it's my product that's different because I have an understanding of what that looks like and it's built into the product. I hope that made sense. Um, all right, did, I think we answered all the questions. We still have a few minutes remaining if anybody has any more. Yeah, if anyone has any questions for Holly, feel free to go and throw them in the Q&A chat. But Holly, this is an incredible session. Thank you so much. <laughs> I really love talking about this because I feel like it's a really simple way to start to understand an idea that uh, might, you might be really excited about. And we all, as startup folks, we tend to have a, a desire to chase after that shiny object. <laughs> so I use this as like a, a stop sign on the road of like, here, yield here. Let's do this work first. <laughs> Definitely, definitely useful. Um, it looks like we have two more questions actually just thrown into the Q&A. Uh, yes, um, Andy asks, how often does it make sense to revisit the business canvas once your business is up and running? I use the business model canvas as a way to vet new ideas. Um, and that can be as simple as an existing product, marketing it to a new audience or it could be that you wanna add a new feature to what you're doing. It's a way to sort of work through that process and make sure that all the dots are connecting and all the pieces are coming together. Um, so I don't know that there's any specific juncture points, like I wouldn't put reminders on the calendar or anything like that, which I do with other stuff. Um, but in this scenario, I would use it as a tool when you have a new concept or a new stream of revenue that you want to explore. And like I said, it could be as simple as bringing your product to a new customer, making sure that you've really taken the time to understand, is that demand there for the customer you're trying to serve? Mm -hmm. And then there was a, I, there moved. Um, can you tell us a mistake you or someone else made using the canvas? Absolutely. Um, I prefer to talk about mistakes I've made because I don't ever want to talk about a client in that way. Um, but most of the mistakes are the same ones, honestly, same ones that I've made. So it's, I, I can definitely speak to, I didn't understand how to use it. And so instead of taking the time to, to work on it, I just filled out the bits that I knew, like that I could answer quickly, and then I abandoned it. Um, and that's, you're gonna abandon it. This is not what the kind of document that you go back and forth to like a regular business plan. This is the kind of document that you work through one time and it changes your perspective of what you're building. Um, so I can say like one of the things that I made a mistake with is I didn't bother to figure out the customer piece um, when I did this the first time because I just didn't understand why that mattered in this scenario. I mean, I knew why having customers mattered. That's obvious. But I didn't understand why it was a crucial piece of this puzzle in this scenario and what it, what I was missing by not doing that particular piece because I didn't want to put the time in. I'm being honest there, um, that <laughs> that um, I wasn't figuring out how to get, I, I was impacting distribution, I was impacting all sorts of things by not understanding who my customer was. Um, so if you choose to leave a square empty because you don't wanna take the time or you don't wanna put the energy into figuring it out, it might actually impact all the others around it because there was some crucial bit that needed to be put into play that was a balancing factor. Um, so understanding that is really important. Uh, when exploring services, what are some aspects of the canvas that you approach or think about differently? That's a really good question. Um, so as you might guess, I have a lot of service-based background. So that's, I work with a lot of service-based clients. And um, one of the different things with services is that customer piece, like I just mentioned, is understanding that your service might actually appeal to many different customers. And in that scenario, you might actually want to create four or five business model canvases for the same service being offered to different customers. Um, so that's one of the different ways that I think this, this business model canvas can be used by a service-based business 
is you can use the same service as the thing that you're circling the process around, but you're creating different processes to get that, that service utilized by different customer bases or different, different distribution channels. So like I worked with a client that had a massage, a massage place. And one of the things that we were trying to figure out is how can she create more revenue by getting her service to her clients versus her clients coming to her salon. So there was a, we built multiple different canvases to try to figure out the different customers that might actually need the service. And what it ended up netting was the most profitable scenario in her case was taking her massage tables into a business and offering it as like a Friday perk. And so, but we would have probably never gotten there had we not gone through this journey of looking at different potential customers for what she was taking to market. Because she was, and when we first started the conversation, she was only looking at it from a traditional lens. And so going through this process and I made her list out, like get dreamy and figure out who all your potential customers might be. And then we created all of these different model canvases and that helped her really hone in on where to focus her energies first. Amazing. It looks like we have time for one last question in the Q&A. Uh, there's that one from Nicholas. Okay, let's talk about Nicholas. How should I react when finding a similar startup that's already on the market? Should I just give up, pivot, or try to compete? I actually think this is a really good tool to start to discover that because like I said, it might be if you have a similar product, is that product being utilized by the same audience that you're trying to build the product for? Um, is there a different way to take your product to your customer? Uh, and starting to really look at all of those different avenues, because this allows you a fast way to start to look at those without diving deep um, and sort of getting it down on paper, the different ways that you might be able to take your product to your customer. And what it may result in is that you decide that it's not worth it. Um, it may also open up a door and you're like, wow, I would have never looked behind door number four. And there's a lot of revenue there. So I, just, I would encourage you to, to look at this as a, different, as a way to explore different customer bases and different ways to go to market with your product that might create different channels of revenue. Awesome. Let's, let's actually take one more if you have time for <laughs> Yeah, totally. Yeah, I'm totally fine with me. Yeah, so many questions yeah. are just amazing. There's just this, this presentation <laughs> like spurred so many different thoughts. Um, so we have this other one from Jennifer. All right. If you have multiple levels of rollouts for a technology product, i.e. different levels of your product, all to the same public audience, would you use this comprehensively? Oh, hold on. I have to click read more. Um, brought comprehensively for the overall product offering, or is it best to map out each on its own canvas? Um, yes, it is best to map out each on its own canvas because you may discover things in those journey, in that journey of looking at those that you want to chase things, or you might even want to pull back from things because you thought it was generating flow or revenue or marketing, and it isn't once you actually get it all separated out. And yes, you might actually be able to make six or more of them. Um, I have had clients that do as many as 10 of these dependent on what they're building. Um, but uh, mind you, once you get through the first one, it does start to get a little bit easier because you have answered some of the questions and some of them are going to be the same on each one. You're really just exploring how each separate thing is interplaying and you can really start to understand that.